Welcome back to the fourth module of this course on labor and decent work in supply chains. We have observed how the absence of adequate remedies under Indian labor law is a major problem for Indian workers. Most of India's labor laws do not protect a very large section of Indian workers. Even in those cases where it is rights under a labor statute that have been violated, workers must access corresponding remedies through time-consuming administrative and judicial processes. We are also familiar with some of the problems they face in organizing to negotiate for better wages or conditions of work. And we will learn more about that in the next video. In the context of global supply chains, because access to remedies is compromised in India, local suppliers are unlikely to face accountability for violations of labor rights and human rights. The question that we will continue to look at in this video is how a worker whose labor feeds into production processes that span several countries can seek accountability for violations of labor and human rights. A shocking thing after um, the accidents in factories of the last years where a lot of people died like in Bangladesh or Pakistan was often that uh, companies admitted that they know that there are problems. They often admit that indirectly by saying, well, this does not happen to in our suppliers because uh, we send architects or controllers into the, the factories uh, to look uh, for, um, for safety. Uh, but some of the competitors don't do it. That means that the sector knows that there is a problem, but they, 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 they still buy uh, at, a, at a factory as long as it is cheap. Some control, others don't. And um, there, is no, there was no general movement before Rama Plaza to, um, to control factories, despite the knowledge that there are problems. And this is, again, that's a... That's a um, that's not a due diligence on human rights if you do it like this. Um, you have to look into your suppliers. You have to find out why we are the cheapest. Um, so it might be that they are the cheapest due to very low wages. It might be that they are the cheapest due to a very clever organization of a factory. But uh, your due diligence uh, means that you have to look into it. The obligations of states under most laws and under international conventions stop at their national boundaries. The lead firms in global supply chains are therefore not legally accountable in the host nations. And even in their home nations, they are only legally accountable under a limited set of laws, such as these modern slavery laws and child labor laws. In this video, we will learn about some remedies that are less dependent on the legal systems of individual nations. The first of these is the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. These were endorsed by the United Nations Human Rights Council in 2011 and provided the first global standard for preventing and addressing the risk of adverse impacts on human rights linked to business activity. These principles are built on three pillars. One, state's duty to protect human rights. Two, corporate responsibility to respect human rights. And three, access to effective remedies. Notable in the case of global supply chains is guiding principle 13b. It requires businesses to seek to prevent or mitigate adverse human rights impacts that are directly linked to their operations, products or services by their business relationships, even if they have not contributed to those impacts. The commentary to Guiding Principle 13 highlights that business enterprises may be involved with adverse human rights impacts either through their own activities or as a result of their business relationships with other parties. In this case, the term business relationships should be understood to include relationships with entities in its value chain and any other non-state or state entity directly linked to its business operations, products or services. Lead firms, therefore, are required to understand adverse human rights impacts 
throughout their supply chains, not limiting it merely to their closest tier of suppliers. The UN Working Group on Human Rights and Transnational Corporations and Other Business Enterprises, known simply as the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights, has the mandate to promote the implementation of these guidelines. It has highlighted the importance of national action plans as a means to promote the implementation of the UNGPs. These are policy documents in which a government speaks about the steps it will take to support the implementation of these principles. In February 2019, India published a draft NAP on business and human rights. In some countries, the discussions into such plans have already precipitated legal change. The UN guiding principles are important for Indian workers who are a part of global supply chains because they place duties upon lead firms to be diligent about the human rights violations throughout their supply chains. Uh, for me, a very interesting discussion presently is um, that um, some countries are, uh, now have now national action plans to implement uh, the UN guiding principles on businesses and human rights. In, in, in many, company, uh, many countries, there's still a lot of resistance of industry and, and part of politics, like here in Germany, we don't have a law. Uh, the industry wants to avoid a binding law on human rights due diligence in their value chains. But the discussion alone was a, a huge progress. Um, and even sometimes if laws are weak, um, there is progress. Like in, 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 in Great Britain, they have this uh, anti-slavery act and now companies have to report uh, on uh, suspected slavery in their value chain. There are no fines uh, if, they, if, if they lie or if they detect um, slaves in their value chains. But having to report means that bosses and companies are now asking, do we have a problem in our value chain? And if yes, uh, even if there are no fines nowadays, what will happen next year or the year after? So um, these discussions about uh, Slavery Act in Great Britain, Children's Act in Australia and in, uh, in the Netherlands, um, the law in France on human rights due diligence for the biggest companies, um, similar discussions in countries like Malaysia, Mexico, Kenya, so it's not only in, in northern countries, um, is putting at least some pressure on, on, on industry um, to look deeper into their value chains concerning human rights. So um, this is a progress. When we started at Zutwind working on, on, on value chain, for example, in the garment industry 25 years ago, we challenged uh, here the big companies and many of them said, well, we, we buy uh, our garments via Hong Kong or via Singapore. We don't know where they are produced and we are not responsible for that. Nobody would say that anymore. Um, and the pending laws um, in many uh, market countries here in Europe, and but also overseas, they, they are putting additional pressure on companies to look deeper into their value chains. Another such instrument is the OECD Guidelines for Multinational Enterprises, known simply as the OECD Guidelines. The OECD or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, is an intergovernmental economic organization with 37 member countries, founded in 1961 to stimulate economic progress and world trade. The OECD guidelines set standards for responsible business conduct across a range of issues such as human rights, labor rights, and the environment. In May 2011, OECD members and other governments that agreed to adhere to them updated the guidelines, introducing substantial new provisions in areas such as human rights, due diligence, and supply chain responsibility. Unlike the UN guiding principles, they also establish a government-backed international grievance mechanism to address complaints between companies covered by the OECD guidelines and individuals who feel negatively impacted by irresponsible business conduct. The OECD guidelines are not binding on companies, but they are binding on the governments that have agreed to adhere to them. 
These governments have to ensure that the guidelines are implemented and observed. Part 2 of the guidelines sets out procedures to implement the recommendations in Part 1 through a system of national contact points or NCPs. Every government that adheres to the guidelines is required to establish an NCP to promote the OECD guidelines and handle complaints against companies that have allegedly failed to adhere to the guideline standards. Each NCP is required to handle specific instances of alleged corporate breach of the guidelines. A specific instance is the OECD guidelines official term for a case or complaint about a company's alleged breach of the guidelines. Any stakeholder that can demonstrate an interest in the alleged violation can file a complaint. So what we're talking about here is non-judicial accountability mechanisms. So just to put this in context, I think it's important to understand that often communities have been trying for you know, several years sometimes before these cases will come to um, Accountability Council and to someone like me. Um, we see you know, workers who have been um, unsuccessfully typically trying to reach out to local, um, national, um, state mechanisms. And after, often after having attempted to um, address their grievance through these local mechanisms, they attempt to go more international. So I just want to put these in context that um, these are mechanisms that are often little understood, they're really technical, and often they're much more effective when they are complemented together with local strategies. Local justice is always going to be more effective than international um, you know, justice mechanisms which are really far away. NCPs can handle complaints that allege breaches of the OECD guidelines occurring inside the NCP's country by multinational enterprises headquartered anywhere else in the world. NCPs can also handle complaints that allege breaches of the OECD guidelines occurring anywhere else in the world by a multinational enterprise headquartered in the NCP's country. Complaints are usually handled through mediation or other conciliatory practices that seek to help parties reach mutual agreement on past acts and future goals. NGOs and trade unions from around the world have used the complaint process to address adverse social and environmental impacts caused by corporate misconduct. NGOs have also used the complaint process to raise awareness about the internationally recognized standards enterprises should but often fail to meet. The other set are some, there's more than I think 50 or so, uh, they're called national contact points that are tied, these are tied to the um, OECD group of countries that have come together and have a set of guidelines that's called the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. So under those guidelines, they also have a set of labor standards. I think it's chapter five, which concerns um, employment and industrial relations. And in both the performance standards of the IFC, um, as well as in these OECD guidelines, there are measures to protect workers in supply chains. So there is supply chain responsibility. But as an example of what, you know, if we apply the Assam example to the OECD context, what it would involve is communities, say in Assam, approaching a company, um, say in the UK, an OECD country, a brand, let's say, um, oh, that sells tea that has operations or a supply chain link to Assam that sources tea from Assam. The community would, would approach that English um, or that British company and say, we believe that you have breached the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises in X, Y, Z ways. Um, and so we would like to have a mediation process. And that is the primary function that um, the national contact points provide. They're mediation processes or dispute resolution processes in the first instance. And if mediation, which is voluntary and consensual, if that doesn't, uh, is, if that's not forthcoming or if the company disagrees and they can disagree, 
because it is consensual, then it goes to something called compliance review. Another set of non-judicial mechanisms that can be used to hold lead firms in global supply chains accountable are related to international finance institutions. These are financial institutions that are established by more than one country. Usually, they are owned by national governments. The best known international financial institutions were established after the Second World War to assist in the reconstruction of Europe and provide mechanisms for international cooperation in managing the global financial system. They include the World Bank, the IMF and the International Finance Corporation. Generally speaking, these institutions encourage private investment as an essential tool for reducing poverty and increasing prosperity by creating jobs, raising incomes and expanding access to infrastructure and financial services. They help finance the private sector's investments that pursue these objectives. They also hold themselves accountable to the people affected by the projects they finance and have independent accountability and oversight mechanisms to address the risks associated with these projects. The IFC, for example, has a Compliance Advisor Ombudsman, or CAO, mandated to address complaints from people affected by its projects. So it is um, styled as an independent accountability mechanism. And there's a whole bunch, there's some 20 odd, um, they're called IAMs, or that's the acronym, Independent Accountability Mechanisms. And they have, like the, the CAO has a, um, there are safeguards in place to preserve their independence. So for example, the head of the CAO can't work at the World Bank after his or her tenure. Um, and there's a, a, you know, a fixed tenure, there's a sort of um, process, a, a rigorous process by which the, um, the head is selected. And that involves the input of civil society. Um, so th there's uh, also provisions in place to ensure that the, the CAO, the head of the CAO, reports to the president of the World Bank Group. And that makes the CAO separate from World Bank management, from IFC management. And so they're, they're not you know, part of the loan teams, the, the teams that are deciding the investment decisions. They're very separate to that. And so there are these sorts of um, safeguards and checks and balances in place to ensure that there's an independence. Um, and, and I've just given one example in this Assam case at the IFC of, of the Compliance Advisor Ombudsman. These accountability offices exist at all of, or I think almost all of the major regional and international development finance institutions, um, whether it be the Asian Development Bank or the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the new kid on the block, or you know the um, the ones in uh, other regions of the world, like um, say the Inter-American Development Bank or the African Development Bank. These are all uh, institutions that now have accountability offices. We will now consider how the workers of a tea production firm in the state of Assam have used the IFC's accountability mechanism. This was the company that I mentioned, Amalgamated Plantations Private Limited. It's majority owned by the Tata Group. The International Finance Corporation has a 16% equity holding in this company. So the World Bank Group actually partly owns this company together with the Tata Group. Um, and so the IFC invested in 2009. As I said, in 2013, the there was three local Adivasi-led organizations that are supporting tea workers that filed a complaint to the Compliance Advisor Ombudsman. That's the name of the IFC's accountability office. Um, they argued that the workers were receiving low wages, restricted freedom of association, hazardous housing, as I mentioned, hazardous toilets, really poor sanitation, poor drinking water, um, really hazardous exposure to dangerous pesticides. Um, and generally, they, they were really concerned about poor consultation with workers, including on a worker shareholder program. So that's sort of how the IFC got involved in this project. They wanted to introduce a shared worker ownership program. 
the theory being that that's how you could lift workers out of poverty. Now, as I mentioned, the um, the workers had been, you know, complaining for this for, for some time and they hadn't, they, they don't have any real local um, genuine advocates. There's, there's really only one union in Assam that is sort of in bed with the tea industry. It's called ACMS, Assam Chamas Sangh, And it has a history of undermining workers' rights, uh, really unfortunately. And so workers felt that they needed to turn to the IFC's accountability office, not finding um, any local uh, you know, avenues. They'd also, there, there have been attempts at litigation in the Guwahati High Court, but um, there's a whole story there for how the tea industry has, has really sort of callously um, prevented local efforts to increase wages, etc. So for all of these reasons, the, the, the workers felt that they needed to approach an international mechanism, um, however flawed and, and difficult these mechanisms can be. Um, in 2016, the CAO, the, that's the IFC's accountability office, released a report um, and it was sort of a, a really comprehensive vindication of workers' right, uh, workers' claims. Um, it, it, it's a 94-page report, the longest um, that I believe that they've ever done, that you know vindicated and documented all of the failings on the part of the IFC to ensure that Performance Standard Two on on labour issues was being complied with. Now I should say that. At the early stages of this process, there was an attempt at dispute resolution, at mediation, where the company representatives, these three NGOs, you know, that support workers, they, they came to the table uh, at a dialogue facilitated by the CAO, the IFC's accountability office. And unfortunately, um, that wasn't successful. It wasn't a, a dialogue that um, could really, uh, the parties couldn't really find much agreement. And so that's why it moved to the compliance. And uh, I sort of mentioned that in November of 2016, you had this very comprehensive um, report by the, the Accountability Office vindicating workers' claims. Unfortunately, the IFC's response to the uh, very comprehensive report was um, really disappointing. It disagreed for the large part with most of the findings of the Accountability Office. Um, it did agree that on some of the issues relating to human health. So on some narrower issues around, you know, the need for toilets, drinking water, adequate housing, the IFC did agree that these were not compliant and that um, they needed to do more. And they agreed to this two-year accelerated action plan where they would work together with Tata and the company, APPL, in order to um, you know, uh, fix those human health issues. Um, fast forward to 2019, last year in January, um, the CAO does monitoring reports, uh, most often about one year after the investigation, and thereafter every year, just to see what is the IFC doing, um, uh, is the IFC responding to its investigation. In this monitoring report of last year, unfortunately, the CAO found that a lot of the issues persisted, a lot of the non-compliance persisted, and actually the IFC had done really not enough. That There was some progress, very limited, on certain issues, but not nearly enough, and, and for the most part, the promises that had been made were broken. Um, the, I think the most damning, perhaps, um, statement from the CAO in that report is, is one where it says that if non-compliance with IFC requirements persists, then IFC as part owner of APPL risks perpetuating a system of employment with well-documented negative impacts on workers and their families. And so what that's saying is that if IFC doesn't take action, it's perpetuating a system that is well documented to not be promoting and protecting the health of workers, which is the very objective of the performance standards and the mandate of 
the IFC, which is to reduce poverty and to uh, you know protect workers. Um, unfortunately, the IFC uh, did put out a response to the uh, monitoring report last year, but it it wasn't a very um, satisfactory response. It basically didn't respond you know head on to these non-compliance findings. Instead, it just committed to a sector-wide study and a facilitated dialogue to try to build trust and to find some common areas of agreement between the parties. So um, I think th this is a dialogue that we're hoping to you know, um, resurrect with the company, with the IFC, with Tata, to try to, after all of these issues have now been well documented, to try to you know, come back to the table and see if um, we can find resolution. This case from Assam that was taken to the IFC's Compliance Advisory Office or CAO illustrated some of the benefits and drawbacks of taking a complaint to the independent accountability mechanism of an international financial organization. In terms of potential drawbacks of accountability mechanisms, I think I would say that the key uh, points to, to remember are that these mechanisms um, involve a lot of time and uh, there's a lot of effort and energy that is needed. They're slow. Um, the Assam example we're, that we're continuing to work on, as I said, the communities first filed their complaint in 2013. So um, this is a, these are long running processes. Um, there's evidence requirements that, that uh, can be difficult to, to sometimes obtain for communities. Um, we've you know, been supporting um, the, the now two organizations, PADRA and PAD, with documenting violations of Performance Standard 2, but that is not always easy. Um, there's a potential for a failed negotiation or dialogue process if, for example, one of the parties isn't interested in dialoguing, then it's a consensual process, at least dispute resolution is. So you can spend you know, years in a negotiation and then one party can say, I'm done, I'm walking out. And so that's another important drawback. Um, that can lead to a loss of momentum in a movement. Um, you can, at, at the end of the day, these mechanisms are not courts. They're non-judicial as, I just explained, the CAO had a incredibly strong 94 page report, dense with non-compliance findings. And the IFC said, we largely disagree to many of those findings. So there's, unfortunately, this is an evolving um, you know, system and there's two sides of the system. There's the accountability mechanism, the CAO, which did a great job from where we're concerned. But then there's the other side of the system, which is the IFC, the actual financing institution, which has to, you know, um, do the right thing. And this system requires that both sides of the system works. And so this is not a court. It's a system that relies upon good faith, persuasion, and, you know, um, doing the right thing. And, and sometimes pressure is, is what we need to do as civil society to give some teeth to um, these mechanisms that currently don't have, have many. So um, the final drawback I'd like to flag is that when you raise as a community your profile to an international level, there can be retaliation that uh, you bring upon yourself. Um, and, and we've unfortunately seen this too often with many communities who you know, um, file complaints and you know, there is a strong nexus between states and companies. And so this is, you know, you know uh, that shrinking space for civil society and for dissent is definitely something that communities need to understand and, and weigh the, the risks of retaliation against the you know, potential positives before they engage in such a process. In terms of the potential benefits of these processes. Um, I would say that the, the biggest one is that they bring, well, they have a potential to bring international scrutiny and exposure at an international level 
to abuses that are happening in you know often far-flung parts of the world um, and so that that sort of amp can amplify a community's voice to the funders of a project to a company and to international media um, you can often get a really strong independent report that documents violations and we've seen that in the Assam case as I said the 94-page report, to my knowledge, it is the most comprehensive report that the CEO has done. Um, media attention. We have plenty of this um, to talk about in the Assam example, um, and I think it, it can be a really effective way of um, getting improvements. And we have seen improvements on the ground at Amalgamated Plantations Private Limited. They have been incremental and you know, in bits and pieces, these are 25 plantations that we're talking about, and there have been, you know, some improvements, but the the sort of scope of improvements hasn't been nearly enough. Um, the other couple of final benefits that I wanted to mention would be that, um, you know, as I just flagged, there there is a potential for institutional change, both at the company level as well as at a funding, you know, uh, funding or investment level. So I know that um, the IFC has learned a lot from the Assam case, um, particularly around labor and some of the forced labor issues or modern slavery type issues that you see on tea plantations. And they've, I, I believe that they've, you know, certainly learned a lot about the risks that plantations bring um, for for workers and um, hopefully that that at least can can feed into how their financing operates in the future. In this video, we have learned about the non-judicial grievance redressal mechanisms available to workers under the OECD's National Contact Point System and under the independent accountability mechanisms of the international financial institutions such as the World Bank and the IFC. We learned how these mechanisms are not substitutes for the remedies available under local justice systems, but can certainly be used to bring international scrutiny to labor and human rights abuses. Both these are methods to seek accountability from lead firms for labor and human rights violations in their supply chains. We also learned about the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights and how they require lead firms to be diligent about labor and human rights in their supply chains. So far in this module, we learnt about some methods that workers can use to access their rights and to improve their conditions of work. The first set of such methods were remedies under Indian law. Another set of such methods relied on intergovernmental organizations and sources of international finance. These methods are more useful when workers are organized. When workers are organized, they can also use the method of collective bargaining to access their rights and to improve their conditions of work. This is what we will learn in the next video. Thank you for watching.